donc je vais m'exprimer en... So as I was just saying, I will be addressing you in French. I'd like to begin by thanking each and every one of you. I know that this has been a very busy day, so I thank you for carving out the time to meet this afternoon with Christophe, with your humble servant myself, and with our respective teams. A great pleasure to welcome you, ladies and gentlemen of the press, as is always the case. Particularly a pleasure to welcome you on this first day of the French Presidency of the Security Council. We'll be exercising the presidency for the entire month of March. The unique feature of this afternoon's press conference is that it is the first step in an unprecedented expression of Franco-German partnership here in New York. I'm going to suggest that I deliver an opening statement in three parts before opening the floor to your questions. I'll begin by explaining to you the philosophy and mindset underpinning this joint Franco-German approach that is shared both by the French and German teams, spearheaded by myself and Christophe Huysgen. After that, Christophe will share with you the joint approach that France and Germany will be pursuing in terms of the working methods for the Security Council, which is very important as well. And thirdly, we will in turn, that is myself, your humble servant, and Christoph, the Ambassador of Germany, uh, share with you the closely coordinated priorities of the French Presidency in the month of March and the German Presidency in the month of April. So with that menu before us, hopefully an appetizing and tantalizing one, I will begin by just sharing a few words on the philosophy underpinning this unique and innovative joint Franco-German approach to the presidency of the Security Council. As I think many of you might know, we decided to seize this golden opportunity of having successive presidencies by France in March and Germany in April, which was a pure happy coincidence. It turned out like that simply because of the alphabetical way in which presidencies are uh, are selected for the Security Council. And so we decided as we would be working successive presidencies, we would join together with our working teams and closely coordinate our programs of work to make sure that they were dovetailed and harmonized with one another. If I could sum it all up in one word, the purpose and the philosophy of this uh, approach, uh, this twin presidency of the French and German delegations, it is innovative. As well as being innovative, it is also pragmatic, pragmatic in its approach. So innovative in principle and pragmatic in approach. This is not a merging or a coalescing of the two presidencies. Rather, it is an expression of close cooperation between both presidencies, fully respecting the right of each of the two partners to identify their priorities uh, during their uh, respective months of presidency. And we pursued this common and or twinned approach well, with three purposes in mind. The first is to uh, regalvanize the Franco-German partnership here in New York in the framework or context of the United Nations. The second objective or purpose that explains this twinned approach is the need that we see to defend and uphold European values as good Europeans and to contribute to voicing here in the heart of the United Nations a European, a strong European perspective which I think the world needs today. And the third goal or purpose, which flows very neatly from the first two, is to defend or uphold multilateralism. It seems to us that multilateralism is currently under siege and upholding multilateralism is vital because multilateralism is more needed than ever in today's world, particularly given that it's being so sorely tested. And this joint or twinned Franco-German approach, both innovative and pragmatic, forms part of our joint efforts being pursued with others as well to reform renew, recast, and refound multilateralism, to regalvanize it as a principle at a time or juncture when, as I've just said, we believe this is more necessary than ever, that need to safeguard and defend multilateralism. So in just a few words in a nutshell, and I could expound upon this at much greater length, but I'm aware of time, but that is in a nutshell the philosophy, the mindset which explains and steers this, un this innovative partnership between France and Germany in our exercise of the two presidencies through the months of March and April of the Security Council. I'll now give the floor to Christophe to expand further, if you will, particularly touching on the working methods of the Security Council. And thank you all for coming um, on a Friday afternoon to this uh, briefing. We, um, we see your interest in, uh, in our briefing also a bit um, reflected, um, the interest in, in this um, absolutely um, new 
development in the uh, Security Council that you have two presidencies that follow each other that actually try to have joint presidencies. And um, I would like to add one, one element to the three elements that Francois has mentioned that uh, are behind our um, jumelage, the, um, the German-French uh, partenariat which um, through the Treaty of um, Aix-la-Chapelle that was um, concluded a few weeks ago here has another expression, um, the European voice that we want to strengthen through our, um, through our um, uh, joint presidencies and um, the overarching goal to defend and strengthen multilateralism and we want to do that with this new approach and uh, maybe we want to also give an incentive to others to, to think how we can strengthen um, with a new um, uh, way how to, to approach the work, uh, how to strengthen this multilateral. I want to add one element. Um, when we presented this morning and this afternoon the, um, um, the joint presidency, um, we realized that, for, that something that is absolutely natural for Francois and me, for, for the... For, um, our generation and future generation that this German-French friendship, many people still see in the historic context, the historic context of two countries that fought um, three wars in the span of, of, of 70 years. And uh, that now, um, since uh, Konrad Arno and de Gaulle, we have found to a, to a friendship, a relationship which is as, in, as um, intense as you cannot imagine. And uh, um, this... Um, what has been able to achieve from, from arch enemies to the closest friends is something that gives an example. And um, you know, we just a few weeks ago um, saw how um, the Greeks and uh, the North Macedonians were able after 20 years or 30 years to, to actually come to an agreement. And I think this, for the many conflicts we have, I think to a certain degree maybe this gives also um, a new thought or um, now maybe an incentive, um, what Germany and France has, uh, what we're able to um, achieve, we can also achieve. Maybe it's, the goal is too high, but uh, I just wanted to, to share that with you. Now come and let's go to the very practicalities of our daily life. Um, for somebody like me who is um, uh, somebody who for the first time has a uh, post in, in New York and is for the first time in the Security Council. Um, we thought um, that the working methods, maybe there is some room for improvement. And um, what we have looked at, and the, our teams, by the way, who work uh, very well together in a remarkable way, um, what they have, um, what we have uh, also looked at is the famous Note 507. The Note 507, which you are all familiar with, which um, looks at the working methods, how can we do it? And we will try um, in two months to see to it if we cannot um, achieve some progress on this. What do I mean? What we would just see to it if we cannot make um, a bit more efficient use of the time in the, in the council and um, we would like to follow a few guidelines. First, um, we would like to see to it that we get a bit more exchange. You know, you, 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 you all follow these, you have um, um, uh, briefers and then you have the 15 members speak one after the other. And it's rather exceptional that then there is an exchange. We would like to encourage this. We would like to encourage the two-finger rule that, that people then ask questions um, or ask questions or make comments in relation to remarks that have been made by a previous um, speakers. Um, talking about briefers, um, briefers are key. They are the special representatives either of the council or um, of the secretary general in most of the cases. They are the people on the ground and we yesterday had two fantastic uh, briefers um, on uh, Syria and on, on Myanmar. Um, and they give their, their, their briefs. What we will try to, to do by talking also to them that the members get their speaking notes, their briefs, a bit in advance so that um, we, we know what um, the substance is of what they say and then we ask the briefers to concentrate on operational issues or on recommendations which would also then allow for the speakers to 
directly go back and, and respond to these questions that they ask, the recommendations they give, um, the initiatives they want to take. We will also try then to, to motivate speakers um, around the table um, that they speak, as is suggested in note 507, for five minutes only. Um, and um, I think this is um, something that um, um, you know, we see there are, there are many who are very disciplined, but there are others maybe who um, then repeat what has been said before. Sometimes you know, when you have three briefers and, and three foreign ministers, it takes five minutes after you know, everybody greets um, you know, the, the, the briefers and the foreign and everything. I mean, this could be done once by the presidency and then everybody goes directly into it. I don't know if this is going to work, but you know, we, we, if, you, if you add up, you, we, we, we need some time. But um, so we, there are some, some, some possibilities. We also would like then, if we gain some time, we would like the briefers who usually speak at the beginning and then um, don't speak again. Um, they do this in close consultations, but in the, um, in, the, in the chamber, they don't come back. We want also to have this possibility that the speakers come back then to, um, to questions that are asked to them so we have a bit more. more. The proof of the pudding will be, will be, um, will be in the in the in, in the eating. But this is our intention, and if we you know, make some progress, um, we come again to that what Francois mentioned at the very beginning, and that is, give a new impulse to multilateralism, impulse to this body here, which is, after uh, in the end, the core of of multilateralism, at least with regard to preservation of peace and security. So, to the to the programs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Christophe. I'd just like to say something on this reform of the working methods, and I know you very well. Some of you, some of us might be a bit blasé, but I don't think we should be blasé or laid back. We really do need to reform the working methods, and seriously, and without further ado, we need to do this. If we really need to breathe new life and new creativity into the multilateralism that we believe in more than ever. So that's really behind our efforts. If I were to sum up, I would say that our aim, our French and German initiative, is to have a process initiated that would allow for true exchanges within the Security Council. The idea is to encourage each other to step back from autopilot, to move away from postures in order to better serve the very raison d'etre of the Security Council, constantly finding day and night areas of agreement in order to achieve decisions, not just words, but decisions to help peace and security. If I were to sum up, that is how I would sum up. I'd also like to make a slightly personal comment, and I don't want to go into the reform of working uh, methods. When they launch a missile, servicemen say, fire and forget. I'm launching my, my missile, and through its head, it goes and finds its target. Within the Security Council, amongst ourselves, it's a bit the same. We seem to just vote and forget. Vote and forget. So we work, and sometimes we have a text, and then there's such pressure that we have to move on to another text, another subject. And I really do believe that here we need to change our methods as well. We need to have a fundamental rethink. When the Security Council agrees upon a text, a resolution, for example, we need to coordinate between the different Security Council members in order to really implement this text. I very firmly believe this. If there's anybody who's interested in continuing the discussion on this, even just one person, I'd be delighted to do so with that person. Now on the substantial priorities of the Security Council for March. So if we really do simplify things, 
uh, in March and April, we're going to look at all different issues, all of the different crises. For example, in March, there are going to be a lot of mandate renewals, MONUSCO, UNMIS, UNAMA, UNSOM. There will be the briefing and the visit of Ms. Mogherini from the European Union, Mr. Lakchak on the OSCE and uh, many other things. But if I were to give you a thread running through, I would say that as far as March is concerned, and indeed most of April, there are three main priorities, uh, political ones and then a geographical one, or policy ones rather. The first topical rather priority is the situation and role of women in conflict situations. This is a huge, vast subject. It affects the protection of women, and it also involves women's empowerment and participation in political processes. It's a vast subject. I'm not going to go on in more depth about it here that is rallying more people and increasingly it is touching at the very heart of the decision-making process and the work of the United Nations. And that is a good thing. So we have different things on this, including on the, in the silence of the CSW, an area formula meeting in particular on the participation of women in political processes. This will be co-chaired by two of our ministers for France. It will be Minister Marlene, Marlene Schappa, and you know her, Germany, Two, we'll organize a high-level open debate on sexual violence against women in conflict in April, and Christoph will talk to you about that later. So the first uh, topical priority is women in conflict situations. The second such priority that both France and Germany share is strengthening international humanitarian law to top events will take place, and I'm summing up, this is on the 1st of April, and Christoph will talk to you about this in more detail. There's a meeting, and an area formula meeting, uh, chaired by the French and German foreign ministers on the protection of humanitarian and medical staff, and a Security Council briefing on the respect of international humanitarian law that we are seeking to promote. So the idea here is to promote international humanitarian law very specifically in terms of how it is implemented. The third such priority is combating the financing of terrorism. You know that this is an extremely important topic. You know that the United Nations has really been focusing very intently on this over recent years. We will organize an open debate on combating the financing of terrorism on the 28th of March. And at that time, we intend to present a resolution on this important issue that is a policy of our foreign, uh, a priority rather, of our foreign policy. I'm going to come back to that later if you like. So those are our three topical priorities. Our geographic priority, among many others, is our Mali and the Sahel. So, for this reason, there is going to be a Security Council mission to Mali and to Burkina Faso. The idea is both to evaluate the implementation of the Peace and Reconciliation Agreement in Mali and the role of MINUSMA, but also to support the G5 Sahel Joint Force as it combats terrorism in the Sahel region. Following that visit, that mission, we will organize a ministerial meeting on Mali here in New York. That is a meeting of the Council, and there are two foreign ministers will participate, as well as the Secretary General and the Malian Prime Minister. So, these really in broad brush strokes of really simplifying things, these are the priorities that will guide France and also the German presidency that will follow, because all of the priorities were defined together. Thank you. Christos. Thank you very much. Um, very briefly, and you will see in the outline of um, um, our program that um, this is all part of this these overarching three objectives. I will um, add maybe a fourth objective with, and I come to that, um, this, and this is disarmament. And uh, we were very happy this morning when we presented this um, to the, um, the outline of our um, program that um, it was welcomed by all the 15 members of the 
Security Council. So, um, with regard to humanitarian issues, um, we ha will have on the 1st of April, as Francois said, with in the presence of the French and the German Foreign Minister, humanitarian issues on the agenda, an ARIA formula meeting on the protection of humanitarian workers and personnel, and the afternoon briefing on international humanitarian law um, with its very concrete um, um, uh, examples and cases to, to, to look at. On the 2nd of April, um, our foreign minister will still be here and we'll have um, a um, briefing to support the implementation of the NPT, of the Non-Proliferation um, Treaty. Um, that is um, one year before the review conference of the NPT to give a new impetus to this um, to this um, debate, which we'll have next year. Um, we'll have on the 3rd of April um, Minuyus, the, the mission in Haiti, and for this we have invited um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Bachelet, uh, to brief on, on the human rights um, situation. Um, again, it's a humanitarian human rights uh, issue. The same will um, will um, hold true on the 9th of April, where we have um, a, a briefing um, by the UN High Commissioner for Ref uh, Refugees, um, Filippo um, Grandi. Um, on the Women, Peace and Security agenda, as um, there will be the debate um, during the French presidency, we'll have during our presidency then on the 11th of April an open debate on women in peacekeeping. Um, this will be chaired by our Minister of Defense, who is a woman, and the Secretary General is planning to be there in person and will present his strategy um, to double the numbers of women in military and police um, um, UN operations. Um, and then on the 23rd of April, we will have um, a high-level open debate on conflict-related sexual violence, um, chaired by our Foreign Minister um, and um, with a number of, of briefers. Um, again, the Secretary General himself um, said that he has an interest to, to participate in this. Um, on the margins of this, we want to do um, as a follow-up to the debate um, uh, French have in March, would like to have a, a meeting where we look to the 20th anniversary of 1325, the Women, Peace and Security um, resolution, 20th anniversary next year, and we would like to have an event where we ask member states to come up with concrete commitments um, where um, the, what they want to achieve um, and they are ready to achieve by the anniversary just to give the 1325 another push. And then on the 29th of April we have open debate on, 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 um, on Middle East. We have a few um, ARIA um, meetings um, also on, on related um, issues, but um, I don't want to go too much into details right now. And um, from my side, that's it. Thank you very much, Christophe. I just wanted to say something very quickly to say that our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jean-Yves Le Drian, will be here in New York from the 28th of March to the 2nd of April, so quite a long period of time. The idea is for him in particular to do the following, and this is not exclusive, not exhaustive rather. He will chair the open debate on combating the financing of terrorism. And I talked to you about that. That is on the 28th of March. Then he will participate in the high level debate on climate. He will speak during the ministerial meeting on peacekeeping. That's something else. He will chair the ministerial meeting on Mali on the 29th of March. And he will participate in the ministerial meeting organized under the German presidency on the 1st of 2nd of April, of April that uh, Christoph has just talked to us about. So all difficult questions should go to Christoph and all easy questions should go to me, your humble servant. The easy questions and which are the difficult questions. Messieurs les Présidents. Presidents, speaking on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thank you for taking the time in your busy agendas to introduce the programs of work to us this afternoon 
We really look forward to uh, interacting with you day in, day out, and I'm sure several times a day throughout this twin presidency. I'm Carla Jane from Agence France Press. My question is on North Korea. What follow-up the Council plans to give to the Hanoi summit? Do you expect the U.S. to come in and brief you on the results or lack of results of that summit? And how do you see the debate on sanctions going forward, given that it's increasingly divisive at the Security Council? I wanted to uh, give this uh, question to Francois, but uh, he considers this a difficult question. No, um, I respond because uh, I'm the, um, the chairman of the 1718 Committee on North Korea um, on DPRK sanctions. Um, I, at this stage, I cannot, uh, I, you know, I have to see what um, uh, the US, um, if they want to give a briefing, if we, if we discuss it, I cannot say. Um, I can only say that from the perspective of the 1718 Committee, Chairman, I am, I, I am of course, in the hands of, of member states. But, um, um, you know, the, the basic line of the Sanctions Committee, of course, is that we look at the danger of the threat that we have from the, the, the nuclear program of North Korea, and the sanctions were um, uh, installed to um, achieve the objective of the international community. And the, except, uh, the, the objective of the international community is to come to a complete, verifiable, irreversible, irreversible um, end of the um, um, nuclear program of uh, uh, North Korea. And um, if you read the result of the summit as I do it, um, we are not anywhere close to this objective. So from my perspective, for the common coming weeks and months, I don't see right now um, the, um, uh, um, any reason to look at, at, the, um, at the sanctions regime. It's a, it's a tough regime. I think that this, the sanctions that have been adopted by the Security Council contributed to um, um, the negotiations that have been, have been taking place. And um, I think, and, and by the way, that the international community was, was ready to impose these tough sanctions is, an, is an actually a very good outcome of functioning multilateralism. And, but as, as a chairman, I don't see that right now there is a need to, to change, um, change the, the sanctions regime. If I could add something to build upon what Christophe has just said, I think that the three rounds of sanctions that have been adopted by the Security Council on the North Korea file have brought pressure to bear, which has been a very useful and effective uh, form of leverage to pry open once again the political process that we're currently engaged in today. I think it's a real success story in terms of pressure being exercised by the Security Council. It needs to be duly understood and accepted as such as a success story. Secondly, I would say that no tangible progress has yet been made on the political track, which we're still on. And it seems therefore to us that the lifting or the lightening of sanctions is not something that should be on the agenda of the Security Council. The time really isn't nigh for those discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Klein of Canada Free Press. First of all, I note that in the footnotes for both months, there's no mention of Venezuela. So is that a sign that the Security Council has now deemed that to be kind of a futile exercise in light of yesterday? And secondly, um, in view of the attention given to uh, the Maduro regime and its uh, repression and so forth uh, and the humanitarian crisis, um, I'm wondering why there's nothing on the agenda for either month regarding Cameroon, where we have thousands of Anglophones been killed. We have re uh, a repression of a dictator of almost four decades. Um, you know, obviously, the stifling of freedom of expression. I mean, I don't have to go on. But is there any reason why Cameroon is not included as part of either the mission or on the agenda? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Starting with Venezuela, together we participated yesterday 
in what was an impasse, a deadlock in the Security Council with uh, entrenched positions that it wasn't possible to reconcile. And each of us heard the different points of view expressed in yesterday afternoon's Security Council's meeting. Should, does that mean that we should simply throw up our hands? Of course not. The re not the resolution of the crisis continues to be a, an objective. We have other tools that we can use and other premises that we can work in, particularly the International Contact Group, which France is a member of. Does that mean that the Security Council should be excluded for the future? Not at all. And yesterday, it was, uh, as I said, it was clear that we had reached an impasse at the Security Council, but that doesn't mean that we shall uh, give up working. We shall continue to work in the Security Council, but also in other fora and using other tools and using all possible bilateral channels and tools. Our main concern, our main purpose, and here I'm speaking on behalf of France, is to ensure that the people of Venezuela can be heard and can take their own future into their own hands. Our desire is that they can speak freely and that they can uh, re-guide their own future they can take responsibility for their own fate once again. We will continue to focus on that. We will continue to focus on meeting the humanitarian needs, particularly as the flow of refugees shows no let up. On Cameroon, the situation is indeed difficult and sensitive for reasons of which you are very well aware. The situation is not being ignored. There is a lot of bilateral. Con there are a lot of bilateral contacts going on. Cameroon is being addressed in the various uh, African fora, and I think it would therefore be erroneous to believe that the situation in Cameroon is not being dealt with, and is not the focus of attention at the international level. That is far from being the case. It is it is discussed on a daily basis through bilateral channels, um, uh, both in the African setting and also through the appropriate plurilateral channels. Uh, Sylvia Zeil from Lorient Le Jour. Uh, le, vous allez bien. Microphone, please, for the speaker. Bientôt se réunir pour discuter. It is my understanding that you will soon be meeting to discuss resolution 1701. I would like, in that context, to ask you whether. And I would say that that resolution talks about the comprehensive implementation of the resolutions of resolution 1559 and I'm talking about the April program of work now this resolution calls for the disarmament of all armed groups in Lebanon in order to ensure that nobody has weapons without the consent of the Lebanese government and no other authorization may be sought than that of the Lebanese government to own or have weapons yesterday the United Kingdom spoke about the uh, Hezbollah group calling it a terrorist group distinguishing between the political and armed wings of Hezbollah. Hezbollah being a Shiite group and has become the dominant force in Lebanon after the elections in May on its political track or political wing. What is the point of view of France or indeed of the European Union if we're speaking more broadly and therefore of Germany as well on that particular issue of Hezbollah in Lebanon? Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. As far as France is concerned and before I turn things over to Christophe, I would simply weigh in very briefly to say, firstly, that our position on Hezbollah is very well known and has been very well expressed in the past by senior ranking officials from my country. And so I will not repeat what they have said today because I think that would keep us here too long. But France's position on Hezbollah is well known and well substantiated. Secondly, I think that the particular friendship for our Lebanese friends is something that we see tangibly here in New York as well. I've just left a meeting where I engaged with the ambassador of Lebanon, a meeting that I was at together with Christophe, we had a discussion, and that relationship is at the heart of the ties that bind together France and Lebanon. It's, it's a, a, um, it is a very warm relationship without an, without an equivalent. I'm sorry, I was just trying to refine the thread of your questions. I, I got a little, a little muddled. Uh, Hezbollah, I've already touched upon. Paris. Uh, 
as far as the European Union is concerned, much has been said in the past with regard to our position on Lebanon. Perhaps I could say as a third point or, or a third string to this particular bow, if I respond to just part of your question, then I will be leaving uh, to the side what I believe is part of the one of the key points of the action as the United Nations. I'm speaking wearing my hat as representative here at the United Nations. And one of our core objectives within the United Nations, as far as Lebanon is concerned, and we're speaking here as a friend of Lebanon and as well as the pen holder on the Lebanese file, is to maintain the unity of the Security Council on Lebanon. And this is the compass that guides our action here in New York and Lebanon. It's not very easy all, all the time, but the fact that over the last few years we have, thanks to a great deal of sweat and effort, been able to achieve unanimity in the Security Council repeatedly on key issues, including issues that you have just referred to, including the disarmament of local militia in Lebanon, just to take one example, which is one of the more thorny and sensitive, sensitive issues as far as Lebanon is concerned. That is one of the key objectives of France here in New York, is to maintain that sense of unanimity on Lebanon and on the Lebanon dossier. And in so doing, to keep a very close eye on the Lebanese dossier here in New York. Thank you very much. I can only briefly add to it that, um, um, as some of you may know, or probably not many, um, UNIFIL is, um, is the second operation where Germany has a number of soldiers. We have the maritime component of um, UNIFIL, and therefore we follow, we follow developments, of course, very, very closely. Um, um, uh, with regard to, to Hezbollah, um, there is nothing that uh, we decide here in, 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 in New York. These are, these are decisions that are taken by the government and by the European Union. And um, what um, Francois said with regard to, the, um, to keep the unity of the Security Council holds true for the European Union. The decision um, to have um, the political arm of Hezbollah subscribe, of course, um, has to be thoroughly thought through. Um, I mean, we don't have um, illusions about um, But at the same time, um, you have to work and you want to work with the government. And um, um, what consequences um, follow when you have then um, um, part of the government maybe on, on listed? This, of course, has to be thought through. So I think these are decisions that have to be taken um, um, at, um, on the level of the European Union and, and well, well thought through. Thank you. Um, Michel Nichols from Reuters. about the high level of interest. Thanks. Michelle. I will keep it short. Uh, North Korea, follow up to Carol's question. Um, last year, the meeting on human rights abuses in North Korea was postponed. Um, some of us presumed, rightly or wrongly, that that may have been to do with the summit between um, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Now that that summit has been held, um, will you try to push to hold that meeting during either of your presidencies? I count at least eight votes, and uh, I'm sure you could probably find the ninth vote if you really tried. Um, so if you could give us an update on that. Um, and on Myanmar, yesterday um, we heard about the lack of progress. Um, is the council planning to try and take any action on Myanmar? Well, with regard to, to North Korea, the summit just took place, and uh, we have to... Um, we have to to um, look now how we we proceed. Um, you know that f both for France and Germany, um, human rights questions are very high on our agenda, and we we just have to to um, to see how um, we will um, we will follow up um, with regard to the um, uh, the the. Um, Sanctions Committee um, related to human rights, humanitarian issues. You, uh, you may have seen that there with regard to humanitarian um, exceptions. Some were granted and um, uh, so that um, actually the, um, the situation of the, of the people that suffer under this regime is maybe a bit alleviated. With regard to Myanmar, I just didn't get the question. Um, uh, it was mainly to do with Britain circulated a resolution in December um, is the council going to try and take 
any kind of action on Myanmar. Nothing's happened with regard to returns. So do you think the council should get involved? Well, at this stage, and um, I um, have to ask Francois, because he was um, already last year, of course, in Security Council, um, we have a new, um, fairly new um, uh, special envoy, and the special envoy um, has been have had his her first report yesterday to the Security Council. She explained, maybe also to the media, I don't know, she explained the, the very complex situation there. Um, and um, um, of course, we, we, we need to do everything that the return of the Rohingya is possible, but they have to come under circumstances which, which um, allow for, for such a return. And this is a very uh, difficult uh, process. At the same time, you have to work with, the, um, with the, the government, the military, and this has been a very secluded um, regime, country, and one has to really s see how do we get to the um, get to the objective and there the right um, thing have to have to be have to be looked at um, there was one issue which I wanted to to, 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 to highlight there that um, with regard to uh, accountability there are so many around the table you know, say, who said that this is really key that you have to fight against impunity that you have to accountability for um, what has what has happened also to to prevent that this uh, occurs uh, again thank you I just want to say something myself on Myanmar regarding Michelle's question. We are not uh, not saying anything. I th believe that there was, under the French presidency, on the 6th of November 2017, I believe, we adopted a significant presidential statement on Myanmar. It talked about the road map and the priorities, the three main areas, uh, humanitarian issues in the broader sense of that term, what is needed to create conditions for a possible return of refugees, those conditions have not yet been met, combating impunity, secondly, and all that implies, and thirdly, in the medium term, the implementation of the Annan Commission Roadmap, and we took an initiative during our presidency of bringing that together. And there were a lot of issues also pertaining to citizenship. So we do have a roadmap. I think it would be wrong for us within the Security Council to say, well, we really can't do anything. We do have a roadmap. It means that on the 6th of November 2017, if I'm not mistaken about the date, uh, it was adopted unanimously and it gives us a pressure to, it gives us something to act. So there should be no excuse. Now, uh, should we go further? Yes, Michelle, that is a question we ought to be asking ourselves. We believe that over and beyond uh, some gestures that have been made by the Burmese government, we are very far away from an ideal situation. Things are moving far too slowly. And so to be frank, there needs to be pressure exerted. The international community needs to exert pressure on the uh, Burmese situ situation, so we should we ensure that the commitments that have been taken be implemented if we really want to make true progress on the three areas that I talked about. So we do have a roadmap, we do have something tangible, and we should work with the tools that we have to hand. Um, thank you very much. Peter Lüdük with the Turkish news agency Anadolu. Uh, a question, a follow-up question on Myanmar as well. After 18 months, do you think it's time maybe for the Security Council to impose sanctions to put pressure on Myanmar? Well, um, with regard to... to um, um, you know, I, I just said, um, first of all, we, we have this Feuille de Route. Um, I just said how important it is to, to look at um, um, accountability and, and see to it that those that, who have committed these um, um, horrible crimes are brought to, to justice. Um, now, in the, um, 
discussions that have been um, taking place in the Security Council so far, the, the emphasis was on, on accountability to get at these people. At the same time, of course, too, you, you have to see that the government works and, and that the government actually sets the preconditions, the conditions for a, for a safe um, uh, return that fulfills all the conditions that we have set. Um, at this stage, um, the, this, the, the question of sanctions was um, not on the, on the agenda. Um, of course, um, 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 you, when you want to adopt sanctions, of course, you have to, to have the, uh, the numbers there. Um, and um, we have to, to, um, to, to look at that um, instrument. I would say that um, we, as a Security Council, are well advised also to see to it that um, the um, advice that is given by the Special Representative, whose objective is to, to, to have this return of the refugees and um, advise how to deal, that we should listen also to this. Um, and um, we'll have her come back um, earlier again, and uh, um, we'll, we'll have to go from there. But I don't know, Francois, if, if last year's sanctions were on the agenda, what, um, um, how do you see that? No, merci. Sur yes, on that question of sanctions, if the question is to know whether conditions are in place to establish sanctions, that is a question. If the question is, is the threat of sanction something that could be used as a lever, the response I do believe would be yes. I can't really be clearer on that. Secondly, on the human rights question, I just forgot what Michelle asked about as well. I, I do believe that in the situation we're in today in the United Nations, as representatives of countries that are struggling to promote uh, human rights, struggling against often strong headwinds, we cannot and we do not have the right to just leave human rights to one side, it be this uh, even if there are important uh, political negotiations. No, it's not possible. It's not who we are. So based on this reasoning, the real question, Michelle, and you alluded to it, is if we want it, can we today, as a procedural vote, get the nine necessary votes to enable us to evoke uh, the human rights situation in North Korea? This is the question. Merci. Thank you. There is a very difficult question, so it should perhaps be for the German ambassador. For the sh because there is a, a sense of unity of Europe in seeing this, um, and probably Europe. Uh, uh, my name is Stefano Vaccara, La Voce di New York, Radio Radicale in Rome. So there is a sense of unity for Europe, and, and so I congratulate you for this uh, showing. But in reality, Europe, when you see a Europe, there is not that unity so much. I, and I, can, I could say many problems, one on migrants and so on. But my question is about the Security Council representation, eventually reform. Just Monday, the Foreign Minister of Russia, Lavrov, said that the Security Council need a reform and there is, the European, that there is too, too much European representation. That's our, his word. So my question is, how Europe can show its unity in showing a position about security council reform, if it ever would be reformed, and not instead showing again division. And I could just mention, for example, the position of Germany and Italy. Thank you. Since it was directed to me, first of all, um, let me let me say with regard to um, European unity, um, you. Um, um, I'm sure you, you, you heard what um, 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 the French ambassador said with regard to the overriding principles for these two months is to have a strong European united voice. And um, when you have been over the last year 
um, been a regular to come to um, Security Council meetings, you have, must have witnessed some of the many stakeouts that um, the European ambassadors in the UN have uh, made. Um, the last one this week on, on Venezuela, where we not only have the current members, but also the past members, including, by the way, um, um, the, our good friend, the Italian ambassador. Um, now, with regard to Security Council reform, um, I think that, um, and there I uh, totally agree with the with um, the, the Russian ambassador, that uh, the Russian foreign minister, that we need a Security Council reform. The Security Council does not, in its present composition, reflect the realities of this world. And uh, um, there also you can see. Um, um, I think it was a close meeting, but the intergovernmental negotiations that took place earlier this week, France and Germany spoke again with one voice on this and need, we need to have reforms. Um, we are not even close to, to have a discussion, should there be more Europeans um, uh, there, because there is a blockade that we don't even get to a text-based negotiations where the different options that are and Italy and Germany are not in all details on the same uh, line, uh, but we don't even have a basis where, from which we can, we can start to negotiate to do this reform. And um, I take your remark maybe as a signal of readiness that also um, the country from the area is ready to go into this direction that we have a text-based negotiation where the different options are there and then we make, make for it. Because if you, if you don't reform the Security Council, um, the Security Council will lose legi legitimacy and, and therefore I think we should really work forward again. Here I'm also very grateful for the um, close cooperation between Germany and France with regard to the position on, on, on the reform. If I can just add something on that topic as well. In our minds, the key to UN reform and its credibility in the long term is openness. Openness works through three different areas. So the openness of the Security Council, the expansion of the Security Council. That is a strategic aim that France has, and I do believe that it is Germany's strategic aim as well. So on this, we don't just have a shared uh, joint uh, opinion on this, we want uh, an enlargement of the Security Council in the two different categories, uh, non-permanent and permanent, in permanent category, India, Brazil, Germany and Japan, and equal represent or equitable representation of Africans. And so that is the first crucial part of it. If we believe in the UN and the representative nature of the Security Council, we need to ensure that enlargements be ex a success sooner rather than later. The second pillar for openness is that of partnership. The UN cannot be recognized as the center of gravity for multilateralism throughout the world unless the UN can step up partnerships, for example, with the African Union in the peace and security area. That is an extremely promising partnership or, for example, with the World Bank in the area of development. So these two partnerships are extremely dynamic today. The third area of openness is openness to civil society, openness to the business world, to NGOs, to trade unions, all of these stakeholders that breathe life into the UN. I do believe that if together we are able, of course this is going to take time, to have success in all of these three areas of openness, then this is going to be helpful for the future and the credibility and the success of the Security Council. And the reform of the Security Council through its enlargement is one of the key areas and is indeed a key a priority of our diplomacy for this reason. Perhaps we can have a question with Elizabeth at the back and then... Microphone for the speaker. 
Was it difficult to set up this twinned presidency? That's a technical question. And what was the response from your counterpart in the security ca counterparts in the Security Council in particular, um, from member states? It was incredibly difficult because it's so tough to work with our French colleagues. No, um, listen, it's. Um, we uh, actually the, the the exercise of putting the program together um, um, was um, really it was a pleasure to work together we see um, you know we have this common objective to work to to work together to strengthen the multilat multilateralism and with france and germany who to have the same objectives uh, here and and to put this together and give this new impetus i can only see see it from my team and what i witnessed um, on on your side that there is a lot of enthusiasm putting it together so there was um, no no problem i think it was even an incentive for our our teams but i speak under your control and I mentioned a bit earlier about the, the, the reaction. And um, I was even struck by the very, very positive reaction that we, that we um, reached uh, earlier a bit informal, but then today in the more formal meeting. So a lot of enthusiasm, a, a lot of support for this. And I, I, I even felt a bit of a yearning for somebody, something new um, that gives um, a, a new, new drive to this. This was my, but maybe Germans are a bit too idealistic, but Francois. <laughs> I have nothing to add because I cannot agree more. And I think you said it all. There is enthusiasm, a very positive. Uh, the reaction was very positive, the reaction to the Franco-German initiative in and of itself, but also a positive reaction to what it represents as the winds of change and innovation in the United Nations. So on both of those fronts, it was very welcome. It was very striking, in fact. It was very striking this morning in the Security Council, the reaction. Does that include the Russians and the Americans, says the speaker? From the American side, yes. From the Russian side, you'd have to ask them. Merci beaucoup. Um, I want to, Melissa Ken, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, I missed a small part, so I'm sorry if you've spoken about it, but I was wondering if you could give us um, more information on the Security Council trip to Mali, the dates, who will be represented at Mali, where you'll be going, will you be going to Gao, Kidal, Timbuktu, and what the point is of the trip. And second, for both of you, is si ça serait possible d'avoir une would it be possible, to, if it would be possible, to have some of the answer in English? Notice that this joint presidency happens to be taking place at the same time that we're expecting a big Brexit vote. And you spoke about a European voice, and I'm wondering if, well, if that was just coincidence. Very briefly, uh, perhaps that is not as important to you but we're talking about twin presidencies or joint presidencies and i want to make it very clear that we're talking about plural presidencies this is not a joint or twin presidency but these are twin presidencies and that's a very important point as far as we're concerned these are two separate presidencies that have twinned together uh, on Mali, the Security Council will visit Mali and Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso for security reasons. I'm afraid I can't tell you more about that for the time being. I can't give you the dates, nor can I tell you exactly or precisely where we intend to visit. We will meet with key actors in civil society, with leading members of the government, and the purposes of the field visit I already addressed earlier. But as far as the modalities are concerned, it's a little bit earlier. Uh, we can get back to you on that a few day, in a few days' time. The second question, you know, when Britain two years ago asked for the Article 50, they looked at the calendar and thought, when do, does Germany and France have the presence of the Security Council? Um, no, I must say, with regard to our relationship with, with uh, uh, Great Britain, um, we have a wonderful cooperation here. Um, they are part and uh, integral part, and we have seen this on, I've seen this since I'm in Security Council, on all the issues there was a European voice, which um, Great Britain, a, a very strong member of, and uh, so we, um, whatever happens with regard to Brexit, our intention will be um, to continue to work uh, very close with, um, with Great Britain to have this common European voice. Um, Ali, Ali, and then 
Sherbin. And then. Hi. Hi there, Frank Yusiardo from TRT World. Thank you for having this press conference. I hope we see the two of you together doing this several times over the next two months. That would be fantastic. I'd love that. Um, talking about the cooperation, you know, it seemed to me this was spawned from an, an item that you wrote as an op-ed piece back last August for the Financial Times uh, wh that you both collaborated on. And there was a line in there that struck me where you wrote, as the world is confronted with unprecedented global challenges, American commitment to our shared values and common solutions has rarely been more critical. So it seemed to me that the article was kind of speaking to the U.S., not sharing your values. No, oh, um, I mean, um, let's, be, let's be honest. I mean, we have um, a situation with our American friends where um, there are Security Council resolutions that have been adopted jointly and um, which um, now the, the U.S. administration um, is not following through. And um, just two examples, the um, uh, JCPOA um, that um, was endorsed by a Security Council resolution and um, the American government has um, taken its distance from it or take the decision to move the um, embassy from um, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This is against a um, Security Council Resolution 478. So um, um, when we say we want to strengthen multilateralism, that we want to strengthen a rules-based order, um, the IRC are all those who don't, don't follow the rules-based order. And unfortunately, we have seen that the U.S. administration, on, um, for instance, on these examples, have not followed uh, a rules-based order. In certain development. Um, certain developments might have uh, pushed our German colleagues into the arms of the French, which is very much welcomed by us. Um, but all joking aside, our general perspective, our general view that I've explained to you all time and again, and you've listened very patiently, is that in today's world, we do need a committed and engaged United States of America, which is still present on the world stage. I often use personal anecdotes from my time as the ambassador of France to Washington a few years ago. My key message to the White House, to Congress, was to say to the administration at the time, give us breathing room, don't micromanage the world. And my message today to our American friends, and I wish to convey that message through all possible channels, is dear American friends, remain engaged in world affairs, remain also engaged and committed through the United Nations. Fred, I, uh, if you call me gullist, um, <laughs> You know, of course, it holds the same holds true what what Francois just said, and um, I said earlier when we discussed North Korea, how important multilateralism, how important multilateralism was for the United States, and and on the North Korean sanctions. If we hadn't um, agreed, all of us at the Security Council, I mean, we were not member yet, but we would have voted yes. Um, then I think all the, this North Korea policy that has led now to a stop of the missile testing would not have been possible. So there is a big advantage of multilateral, and we want to con convince our American friends to, to remain engaged. We need them, absolutely. Thank you, ambassadors. Uh, we've uh, witnessed Security Council uh, failures in the past few years regarding the situation in Syria and yesterday in Venezuela. I wonder whether um, you have in mind any alternative forums to deal with the uh, big issues in the world um, and what those will be regarding the situation in Venezuela specifically. Uh, my other question connected is whether you would encourage other countries in the Security Council in, from the same continents to do the same kind of uh, joint presidency and cooperation in the Security Council and what will uh, the implication be uh, then? Thank you. Frankly, we have no lesson to give to uh, any country and you recognize here the long tradition of French modesty and humility, which is 
really part of our DNA. <laughs> sur votre, uh, sur votre... As to your first question, indeed, solutions can be found elsewhere than on the, other than in the United Nations. We are currently chairing the G7 for the time being, and in that capacity, France is seeking to drive forward an innovative approach to the various uh, files under the G7 umbrella, including policy. The same is true for the Normandy format on the question of Ukraine, which we co-lead with Germany, and I could give you myriad such examples. But that doesn't detract from the fact that there is a single organization that enjoys uncontested and unchallenged legitimacy to take decisions on the, on the matter of international peace and security, and that's the Security Council. There is no other alternative out there, however hard you might search for it. Now, the only solution is dialogue, and together with dialogue, if necessary, decision-taking within the Security Council. That's the understanding as far as France is concerned. And that is why, together with Germany, we often seek to act as a bridge, a go between, between the different actors and the different sides and camps to try and bring people together and ferret out consensus. And so I really don't think that in addition to all of that, we can give up. Venezuela may well come back to the Security Council. We also have, for the time being, the international contact group that's been set up on Venezuela, which can continue to work on this dossier. There's the matter of humanitarian aid, which is something that we cannot afford to relent on either. We need to continue to press ahead with that. But if you look at the current government, it's difficult to know whether it would be possible to reform it as it currently stands. The Security Council, in its response, will not give up its primordial responsibility for ensuring international peace and security, because it is the only legitimate body that can take action along those lines, unless anybody can find an example of another body that enjoys such legitimacy and can take such actions to uphold and safeguard international peace and security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Majid Ghali, Rudaw Media Network. Um, Ambassador Dulacht, speaking of vote and forget, ISIS accountability resolution has been almost one year and a half since it has been adopted. Uh, true, there's a team now in Iraq, but with no tangible uh, result in terms of evidence gathering. Um, what will your presidency will do with that regard? And my second question is to both of you um, about ISIS foreign terrorist fighters. Um, these are uh, your country's citizens, your country's daughters and sons committed crimes against the people of Iraq, Kurdistan, Syria. And now there is this talk about not letting them, letting them come back to Europe. Don't you think it's time for Europe to take responsibility of the action of its citizens, uh, actions that were vital in creating this monster, which is ISIS? Two easy questions. As I <laughs> Thank you. I will be very brief in responding to these questions. Uh, I just want to check you have your headset on. Very succinctly, the fight against impunity as uh, ISIS is seeking is and will remain one of our chief priorities, preventing such impunity. Actions are already underway. You referred to what was decided on in Iraq a year and a half ago after a real fight, after real combat. I, I don't want to go into an exhaustive list, but there are many other venues and many other paths through which we can and in which we are indeed are tackling the issue of impunity for foreign terrorist fighters and for the members of ISIS in general. I recall Bosnia when I was in the cabinet of President Chirac at that time, and we found a way to bring Karadzic and Mladic and other war criminals in The Hague for years. I'm not speaking to you here directly, but for years we were told you will never succeed. This is on a hiding to nothing. It did take time. It took a great deal of time. I have to acknowledge that. But we painstakingly put together the files, the cases. We gathered the evidence. We set up a force to arrest them. And Mladic and Karadic were arrested and were put behind bars. So our hope is that this can be repeated. This will be no walk in the park. It won't be easy. But we hope that the critical mass of the international community are demanding the same for ISIS combatants will lead to the same results and that those responsible will be held accountable and placed behind bars. I genuinely believe that that is what will happen, and we will not let up our pressure as far as this subject is concerned, as certainly as, uh, Fran as, certainly as far as France is concerned. I think I'm not uh, speaking out of turn and saying that I'm sure the Germans think the same thing. Everything to prevent impunity. I said that before on another
another case we have right now with regard to uh, members of the um, uh, Syrian regime in Germany where we, where we have universal jurisdiction. We have now concrete cases where people have been arrested and um, for grave crimes and uh, will be put in front of their judges. With regard to um, the question of the return of, of um, um, citizens, um, German citizens, you, you absolutely have a point. Um, German citizens um, also have the right to return to their country. Um, what has to be done is, first of all, to verify that um, there is this, um, uh, there is a German nationality, but then at the same time we have the obligation to see to it that we don't put um, um, uh, our um, that from these returnees there is no uh, danger coming from it. Therefore, we have to see what um, that we know, that we gather facts, uh, that we gather evidence, um, that um, maybe um, they also have to be um, uh, then um, put in, in, in front of um, a judge. And uh, we have to see where this is done. Um, and um, if they return to, to Germany, we have to, to have these facts. We have to have a possibility to see to it that they don't um, then cause a, a security risk for, risk for the population. I think, I think we unfortunately to, we have to we yeah. stayed longer than we yeah. um, want yeah, intended and um, you also you also want to have a uh, evening we have to leave thank you very much